and it enables a business to scale rapidly without hiring a wide range of full-time staff members to move a growth plan forward. Today, we have a topic close to my heart and many organizations' hearts, and it's really about how you leveraging and entering recognition programs like the best and brightest company to work for can significantly elevate your employment brand. In today's crazy job market, your employer brand is just not a nice to have, it's really a must have. It's what sets you apart, attracts top talent, and keeps your existing employees engaged. But how do you actually measure the effectiveness of your employment brand? And how can you use it to gain a competitive edge? Well, we're thrilled to have a special guest with us today, Jennifer Klug, the president and CEO of the National Association for Business Resources, abbreviated NABR. NABR serves as a national umbrella for several impactful brands, including Corp Magazine, the Best and Brightest Programs, and Mish Business. Known for sharing invaluable data, which we're going to share with you all today, trends and best practices, NABR enables companies to thrive in today's competitive landscape. And as an additional bonus, we have our fave co-host, Mary Lynn Fayomi. Don't tell any of the other co-hosts. But she's the president and CEO of our HR Source. And they're a Chicago-based employer association with over 1,200 member organizations. She's highly respected speaker, trainer, and advisor, and an accepted authority on a variety of workplace issues, including culture, employment trends, and HR management. So whether you're a business leader, HR professional, or an employee interested in what makes a company truly great to work for, this episode's for you. So let's get started. So Jennifer, I want to, you know, open up, but we always love to, you know, you've got a great bio, you've done so many things in your career, but love to always understand what's not on your bio. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure thing. But first and foremost, thank you so much for having me on the program. Uh, I've known Mary Lynn for years, so I'm super excited to have Mary Lynn as the co-host and Kathy. Um, uh, we, we've known each other for a long time, too. So thank you for having me. Um, what's not on my bio? Uh, I, anybody that really knows me knows what kind of... Uh, I guess the proper term is nerd. I'm, I'm a bit of a science nerd. Um, so I, at one point in my life, I wanted to study archeology. span I was talked out of that um, by my business focused family. <laughs> and they said, no, no, don't do that. <laughs> um, so uh, it's a funny thing because there's this TikTok thing going around about when was the last time you thought about the Roman empire well, as someone who like dabbles in archaeology and in history and whatnot, I think about the Roman Empire at least once a day. And I'm I'm a little upset that was only for guys. Like how often do you think about the Roman Empire? I, I think about it at least daily. So my my husband gave a thumbs up uh the other day. Uh and I said, you know, that's from the Roman Empire. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we're driving down the street. I'm like, you know, those curbs are from the Roman Empire. You know, those pipes, those are from the it's just Roman amazing Empire. what yeah. the innovation that existed at those in that period. It's just, yeah. it's incredible. It's fun. It's fun. Um, but I'm a mom. I'm a mom of two college age kids. I love to cook. Uh, I'm of Arabic heritage, so I really like making the Arabic food. Uh, I made a cooking video with my situ or my grandma. Uh, that uh, I wanted to preserve the family recipes. It was it was a lot of fun. I love it. I love it. Yeah, so much going on, Jennifer. I feel like I learned even more today, even though <laughs> I think we've known each other about 20 years yeah. when Best and Brightest first entered the Chicagoland market and HR Source was one of your very first partners and we continue as a partner today. So while many employers are familiar with that brand, talk to us a little bit more about your organization, National Association of Business Resources, but also some of the other programs and services that Kathy mentioned that fall under that umbrella. Yeah, and I sure. think we might want to throw up that slide again. We just asked you to take the deck down, but <laughs> that might also help to illuminate some of the yeah. things that you're working on. Yeah, well, thank you for asking. So uh, the NABR, one thing that everything we do um, 
everything we do has one theme to it. It's igniting greatness in companies and their people. So in a gist, that's who we are and what we do. But uh, most of you know us as the best and brightest where we identify and honor excellence. Well, we have other programs that we do. We have a women's program. We have a best of awards. Um, we have some salute to diversity programs that we have as well. Um, so it's not just the best and brightest companies work for. We also have the best and brightest in wellness. And that's kind of our claim to fame. Um, but outside of that, um, we really are a powerful source of knowledge. Uh, we have some breaking news that goes out, and we're really proud of our publications. So when something happens in the world, it's not just this happened, but wearing those business glasses and, and really trying to help people understand how it impacts them and what they can do about it. Uh, we have all kinds of data. We survey hundreds of thousands of year, um, and we get that out through resource guides and best practices and data. Well, we have a ton of data uh, for everyone to leverage. And what, one of the things that I really like um, being the, the leader of the organization is we, we really do have elite thinkers. Um, we are a very strong community of the nation's top thinkers and, and leaders, and they like to share, we expect them to share ideas, but they like to naturally share ideas. And we have all these discussions and peer groups and roundtables. Uh, we're really helping the individual in addition to the company. So I'm super proud of all of that. And then, of course, anything to run your business, if it has an alphabet letter in it, we, we can help. Um, the daily business operations, there's a RISA and COBRA and OSHA and all that stuff. Mary Lynn, you know about that stuff. It's of course. Stuff. <laughs> it's important stuff. It's time consuming and labor intensive, but it's important stuff. So thanks for sharing. I think that's very helpful to our mm -hmm. uh, viewers to understand if they might only know you through Best and Brightest, which is a wonderful way to know you, that there is a lot more. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, you know, having attended a lot of the CEO forums that you guys host, it's, uh, you're, you're exactly right. The community is so willing to share experiences. I get so much value when I attend those forums and hear from other business leaders and, uh, you know, we, you, you yeah. grow your, your knowledge base in one hour, two hours in a, in a big way in those, in those CEO forums. So I, I want to kind of switch gears. I, we, we kind of start, I started the conversation with the, the thinking about employment brand to us, it, you know, it's, it's your employment brand is, is your brand. I mean, it, it is just how you show up for potential candidates, but Jennifer, what is your viewpoint? What, what, why is it important for companies to invest in their employer brand as part of their overall brand? Yeah, I, I think this is a, this is one of those no brainers, right? Uh, so often, people focus on selling their product and selling their services. And to me, a no brainer is who's talking to your clients and who's interacting with your clients is your employee. That's your culture, your brand, your employee experience. Um, they're siblings to each other. It's like one kid gets all the food and love and attention and the other kid doesn't, but they're, they're siblings. So uh, I feel it's really important uh, to focus on what is your employee experience? Define your brand. And, and Mary Lynn, your organization does an excellent job jumping in and helping people swim in the weeds of this and defining your employer brand, defining your employee experience um, is absolutely critical. And in fact, many uh, HR teams are hiring marketing people within their own uh, companies. So funny little story, this painting behind me, um, is part of our beliefs. Uh, so for us as an organization, we borrow and steal all the ideas from the best and brightest companies. Uh, we have to walk the talk, right? So our overall theme or tagline for our employee experience is um, uh, tenacious ingenuity. So we hired a local artist and we said, paint something related wow. to tenacious ingenuity. And so when somebody sits in this particular hybrid office, that's the message that they're getting. So making sure um, that when your, your employee is sitting in front of a client, 
okay, tenacious ingenuity is behind me. So I have to be tenacious and use ingenuity in helping the client. Um, it goes hand in hand. And you know this too, Kathy, the skills for marketing your product are the same skills for marketing your employee brand. So um, communications, uh, chats like this, um, what your office looks like, what your marketing materials look like, what, what, when somebody walks into your office or your digital hybrid work, what does that look like? That all has to be purposeful, just as purposeful as um, talking to clients, uh, yeah. even more so. We couldn't agree more. I mean, I think, you know, we consider talent a, a growth lane. Um, it's typically the highest expense of any organization or, you know, in the top three. So it is mission critical to mm -hmm. to really be thinking about it in that in that lens. So appreciate you, you giving it some color as well. Can I add something to that too? Sure. And, and this is from the data that, that we receive and I, I tend to preach. So forgive me, just jump in if I start preaching. Uh, but CEOs think that they're communicating. Leaders think that they're communicating. Um, the data is telling us that the employees are not getting the same level of communication that the CEO says they're doing. So when you talk to the CEO of an organization in, the, in our company surveys, oh, we communicate, we do all this, these wonderful things. And then when you go to the employee, they're, they're like, do you trust your leadership? Do you think they're being transparent? And those scores are always lower. So, you know, how you communicate with your clients absolutely has to be the same skill set for how you communicate with your employees and especially top down. I would really recommend that. So there's so many jumping off points here that are way off script. So I'm going to take just a tiny little side road. And this is something Kathy and I discussed with one of our prior guests. And that is this, what I consider the a wonderful evolution of HR and marketing and communications teams, finding each other, working together more Always effectively. Always knew we should be together. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. I mean, it is a match made in heaven. It's, you know, really critical to the effective communications, to delivering on a brand promise, mm -hmm. to delivering on an employee value proposition. So I think that evolution was underway prior to the pandemic, but the, the communication, all of a sudden I'm echoing, I hope it goes away. Um, <laughs> All of a sudden, that pressure to communicate to hybrid and remote workers and dispersed workers mm -hmm. during the pandemic, I think, heightened the awareness by leadership that if not now, when, mm -hmm. if we didn't figure this out quickly, we were going to be losing talent, having people disengaged, you know, low motivation, yeah. right? Our competitors were going to eat our lunch. And then one other little sidebar, and I, I don't go to Starbucks very often, but I stopped on the way here because I wasn't going to have time for lunch. And I thought a little latte might perk me up. I'm pretty perky already, but I thought it could hurt. And what your data shows, Jennifer, and what we hear and learn through the data that we collect is people want it their way, right? I know that's an old Burger King saying, yeah. but I, I equate it with Starbucks, right? You go to Starbucks and people's requests are very specific. So when leaders are thinking, I'm gonna give it the way I choose to deliver a message and it's gonna be in one way, that's not how people right. are willing to receive messaging anymore. So, you know, we're often, I know Kathy's organization and yours, Jennifer, and mm -hmm. mine, constantly working with organizations and employers and leaders to say, you got to mix it up. You got to experiment. You got to communicate in various forums, different mediums, different ways, different sound bites, you know, essays, magazine articles, videos. You got to keep experimenting yeah. until your messages get through and resonate. Let um, me add to that, Mary Lynn. Um, the one thing I think CEOs are missing, and, and when you when we talk to the CEOs, they want most of them want people to come in person. 
we want people back. We want people back. I, I challenge that and push back a little bit on that. But they, the reason why I think this is me speculating is because they can talk in mass groups when people are in person. They can walk down the hallways and hit more people. So the lesson for leaders and managers out there is the one-on-one -on -one communications is absolutely critical. And that experience, yes, it has a baseline, as you were saying, here's our culture, here's who we are. But to have a personal uh, conversation customized for that human, yes, that is the secret sauce. Yeah, and Amen. I, I mean, frequency too. I mean, it, it, you yeah. you think you've been heard, you've said things, you, you've checked the box. Yep, I delivered that message. But I don't know how many times people, that's not their priority, what you're, you know, what you're communicating. And so it, it, it sort of goes right over their head or so really just making sure that there's con constant and regular communication, I think is, is really, yeah. really important. So critical. So now I'll try to veer us back onto the okay. track since I took us off. Jennifer, I I'm think you started me. taking us off and then I just went ahead and we all, <laughs> in any in any event. So there are so many different awards programs out there. In some, in some uh, regions, you know, dozens to choose from. Big, large, small, local, national. Uh, talk to us a little bit about what differentiates best and brightest and what organizations should look for when they're trying to decide whether or not it's worth their time, energy, resources to participate in any of these programs. Because I know there is some survey overload out there. There's some apathy with regard to programs like this, as well as some cynicism. So help yeah. our audience understand what differentiates your program and why it's of high value to participate. Uh, thank you. Thank you for asking. Uh, so first and foremost, we're a service organization. Uh, while we have affiliated um, media uh, partnerships um, and, and exposure, we have our own publication and then we have um, uh, exposure in the Wall Street Journal, whatnot. That's not why we're doing this. We're not doing this to put your name on a list. We have it. Um, we have data. We have a reports. Our goal is to give you those um, reports at an affordable price so you can actually make change. Our goal is to make you the best you can be. It's not about making money. It's not about um, uh, giving your name in lights. Uh, while we have those resources for people, uh, our team spends every day trying to make an impact on your business. We expect you to share your best practices. We expect you to excel each year. We purposely make the survey stringent. Um, we do accommodate survey fatigue uh, so that we can either combine with another survey that's going out or we can um, accommodate when in the year we survey you. Uh, we can customize those surveys. So there's a lot that we do to accommodate people with some of the issues related to going through this program. But the value of this program is about helping each other within the organization and helping each other uh, within the business community, sharing a best practice, sharing knowledge, uh, really this community of elite thinkers. Uh, and then our community is, is, as you said, Kathy, our community is so generous of their talent and their brain power and wanting to make a difference. Um, it's, it's pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, having been a recipient and, and we, we present, you know, participated for a number of years, I, can you share some of the criteria, like examples of the things that you're asking so people can get a sense of, you know, what information they're going to glean from yeah. the survey data? Uh, absolutely. So uh, let me just describe the process okay. um, real quick for those that aren't familiar. Uh, you're nominated. Our team vets you out. Uh, so there's a process, there's like a 10 to one ratio between someone being nominated and them actually going through the scoring process and then another selection uh, past that. So what happens is a company's nominated, uh, we contact them, there's a company survey uh, that goes out. We feel that's very important 
What are you doing? What is your culture? What is your employee experience? What's your engagement? We ask those questions and then we validate it with the employees. So there is an employee survey uh, and that determines your score. And we look at that, we look at both surveys annually. If something is happening in the world where there's a certain area that we score on, we change the weighting on it. So it's very hard to stay on the list. We expect change, change is expected. Uh, some of the categories that we score on, uh, communication and shared vision, which we just talked about, we're, we're one of the only ones that score on that. That's so critical, so critical. Um, obviously, compensation benefits and employee solutions, work-life blend, uh, DEI, uh, creative wellness and well-being solutions. Uh, and we do look at that. We, we take that to our boards and our committees and, and say, okay, what should we be scoring on and how should we change it? So by going through our program, there's um, two resources that you get right away. One is an overall assessment. How did you do compared to the best and brightest standard? Um, and how, 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 what areas do you need to work on? And we do those by our, our scoring categories. The other resource is a snapshot for your leadership. What do they need to know about how you're performing? Uh, and then we have some more robust reports as well and some historical reports. How have things gone up or down over time? Um, uh, where are you strong? Where are your six strongest areas? Don't touch those. <laughs> Don't touch your six strongest areas. Where are your weak areas? What are your employees saying about you? What themes are getting pulled out of that? Um, and then we work with organizations like Mary, Mary Lynn's. And if somebody wants to make change, we throw them in that direction. Uh, and Mary Lynn's organization and others across the country, they swim in that. And they swim in it. They say, okay, why is this score so low? Uh, we'll help you through that. But I will mention, in order to be considered as an elite winner, those are the top scoring companies. Um, the biggest misnomer on, on being um, recognized at that level is that you can score bad in one area and score good in all the others and be considered. That's not true. You have to be a good uh, employer all around. You have to meet a certain threshold in every single category to be considered for an elite winner. And those elite um, uh, winners are scrutinized even further. We, we have eyes on those applications and we make sure that it's really the top of the top that are getting any elite designations. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think that data is really invaluable. I love you know, the ability to benchmark our size organization, our market um, against how other companies are performing. It's great to look at that year over year analysis and see how we're trending or if we've fallen down in a category that has historically been better. So it, 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 I do feel like kind of back to, you know, why to look at it. It's not, I, you know, we love the recognition, of course, that does, you know, hold value to candidates as they're considering different organizations to apply to. And it, you know, is something, it's a point of pride for an organization. But I, if you start to leverage that data, um, in a way to, you know, make improvements in your organization. That's really where the, the power mm -hmm. comes in. And, you know, giving yourself a benchmark or giving yourself a score to try and hit is, I, I think, the way that you can, mo like, monitor and measure and use those metrics to, to say, you know, we're doing well, we're staying on, on track, or, all right, we've got, you know, we've had some setbacks. How do we, how do we you know, resurrect mm -hmm. our score from prior years? Yeah, I think it's something that early on when HR Source was uh, considering various partners, um, Best and Brightest stood out because of the rigor, as well as the metrics. We believe strongly in the you know, benchmarking opportunities and the opportunities to use the information gathered, not just to have a big celebration, which again, we love big celebrations, <laughs> and, but to really use it to improve the organization. Right. If that's the end game, this data can be used for good and it can be used for comparative purposes. Like you mentioned, Kathy, um, that can be tracked over time. So, Jennifer, I think it would be helpful to give just a few examples of how an organization might take that data that's collected mm -hmm. and shared with the leadership 
to consider meaningful improvements to their organization? Yeah, sure. So um, I can give you a couple examples. Uh, one company, they put a committee together, they get the really thick 80 page report and they go question by question. And that committee's responsibility is to fix the low lying fruit and create a strategic plan for their HR uh, strategic planning purposes. Uh, and that's uh, supported by uh, the C-suite. Uh, there's a lot of uh, best and brightest winners that go in and create committees, but it's not just the surveys. Uh, they sit in on the webinars, they sit in on the um, uh, the peer groups, what, whatever we have going on. We have some recommendations that we send to leaders. So we studied the data for them and they would say, here you go, this is, this is what you need to do. Um, and uh, it's the whole thing, it's the whole experience. But um, most importantly is to assign someone to the data. And if they need to make change and they don't know how to, to make that change happen, they really need to find a source uh, to, to help them make those changes. And sometimes it needs to be somebody just looking from the outside in and saying, oh, wow, this is really bad, where, where maybe somebody internally is like, oh, yeah, that's, that's because of this, this, and this. Somebody externally, again, Mary Lynn, somebody externally would say, yeah, no, that, that's a big problem for you, and here's why. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for that shout I, out. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to ask a, one question before I go into my next question, because um, this recently came up for me in, in a client meeting uh, where they didn't want, there was some pushback on surveying the team. And I, I was, I honestly was a little surprised that, you know, my view is always information is power. If you don't know something is is going on, wrong or awry, you have no way to remedy it. So, Jennifer, like, how what would be your guidance for um, somebody that was feeling like they're going to hear bad things? You know, there's a couple of reasons why people are, are a little apprehensive. Um, one would be is they don't want to look in the mirror or they're overwhelmed with everything going on. They really don't want to look in the mirror. And what I would encourage you is we don't want them. <laughs> if that's if that's how they think, we, we don't want them because uh, that's not best and brightest um, thought process. Right. The other thing, the big misnomer is when the economy softens or when there is a recession or there are layoffs going on in a company or there's a merger, there's been a lot of mergers lately. Um, the the general sense is we shouldn't survey. Um, we don't want to know. We let's wait for the dust to settle. And I would challenge them: is that is when you want to survey because your weak spots really stand out, and your strong spots really stand out in those moments. And uh, it doesn't mean that you're not going to be a best and brightest company if you've had to do some layoffs. Uh, it's how you did them and how you treated your team and what your policies are. I hope you didn't put everyone in a room or send a goofy email or any of those bad practices that you hear out there, but did you treat them as you want to be treated? That's what we look for. So I would push back on whomever is apprehensive for um, the data that it's not going to hurt you to have that data. It's going to help you. Yeah, I, I hundred. I, I know Marilyn probably agrees as well. I hundred percent agree. I mean, we we even see that with clients that are um, going through an acquisition or merger, and their customers have that same. You know, like it's not like we had it with our old. You know, experience with this organization and. and to get that customer feedback and sentiment or get that employee feedback and sentiment, then you can say what you're doing to create change and say what you can't do as well, you know, but I, I think that it, it's just, it feels like a big mess to me. Let, me. let me tell you what I, I get on my end on that. I know you were trying to get them to, to do it. What I get is when we tell a person that or a company that they're not a best and brightest company to work for and they think it's us. <laughs> oh no, it's you guys. Oh, that sounds like my mentality. Yeah, so so that's a, another weeding effect of the program too. Is is how do they react when you tell them they're not a winner? 
Um, do no. they say, oh, it wasn't us. We're wonderful. Or do they say, tell me more why I didn't get this. How can we put this into our strategic exactly. plan? Um, we want to be a best and brightest. Please tell me what we're doing wrong. Very interesting to see those two uh, very different experiences. Kathy, to one of your earlier points, I do believe there is a hesitancy on behalf of leadership when they are concerned about the economy, a recession, layoffs, terminations, budget shortfalls. They are concerned about asking questions and not being able to take action on the issues that are raised. So I know that's not um, always the right reason not to survey, but sometimes I hear organizations because surveys are a snapshot of a point in time. And so sometimes organizations say, it's not that I'm not willing to ask these questions ever. I'm, this is really not a good time for us for these reasons. I know I don't have a board who will support the changes that need to be made. I know we're in the midst of some other leadership challenges. We have, you know, these huge initiatives on the docket already. And I think we don't have any bandwidth to add more. So sometimes I believe the hesitancy to survey does come from a legitimately good place where a leadership team feels like they're making the right decision. Now a blanket ban on all surveys or employee input opportunities is a sign of yeah. concern. Yeah, I guess I, the only other you know follow on that I would have to sort of contribute here is that to me, oh, almost any survey that we've done or I've seen a client done, there's likely no way we're going to be able to meet every employee's, you know, request. They're, they, they're asking for things or they want change in the organization and it's not always feasible. But I do think it is an opportunity to say that you've heard them, that you're listening and you know this is for a variety of reasons, something that's important to them and you you acknowledge that you've heard them. And, and maybe it's a timing thing. We're, we're not in a financial position to do it this year. We're going to definitely revisit it. And and you just don't like put it away. You you bring it back up. But I, 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 I guess I still, you know, really believe that the information is powerful and that if you can at least you know, present the why you can't do something and you can't create that change, then people are more reasonable versus that they're just discontent in it and you continue to let that fester behind the scenes in your organization. Agreed. So I'm going to ask this question to both of you because I think you, you've got your finger on the pulse of so many CEOs. And Jennifer, as we mentioned earlier, you, you do your CEO forums. Um, what have you been hearing? Like, what is, this has been, I mean, how many crazy years in a row? <laughs> Another crazy year for many organizations. So I'm just curious, what's what is concerning organizational organization leaders? Um, you know, we can widen the net beyond just yeah. the talent. Uh, what what are you what what's on the pulse of yeah. the? Uh, it, it, there's a lot. <laughs> there is a lot going on right now. Uh, artificial intelligence is is pretty trendy right now. Do we use it? Do we not use it? Should we invest in it? Should we dabble in it? Uh, a majority of the CEOs that we talk to are um, mostly dabbling in it. There are some, some larger companies that are putting some heavy uh, investment into artificial intelligence. Uh, the rising costs and inflation, so what's happening with corporations, uh, costs are going up. Um, profits might be softening or depending on the industry, you're still booming and it's just squishing, it's squishing operations quite a bit. I think that's a very professional word, squishing. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, hybrid work, uh, there is this push pull on hybrid work. We're still um, trying to coach people through that where most leadership want people back in person, required in person. Uh, what we are telling everyone is define what collaboration looks like. Um, so we just re uh, released our recommendations for C-suite 
leaders. And I think that's where the harmony is. What does collaboration look like for you yeah, and your that's organization? Powerful. That's really powerful because I think it's an easy word to say and it's a really hard, regardless of whether you're hybrid or in the office or uh, completely virtual. Yeah, and use some tenacious ingenuity and mm -hmm. defining like what collaboration means to your organization, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. A lot of culture woes out there uh, still, and, and everyone's nodding. Um, it's, it's still changed. There's certain industries that are still dealing with the stuff that we've been dealing with for, for many, many years. There's other organizations that have merged, uh, cult lots of mergers uh, and the woes that go through that rapid mergers that haven't really been thought out. Um, a lot of people shifting, uh, still burnout. We, we're, we're making sure that uh, C-suite leaders know that there's burnout at all, all levels. And we got you got the boomers leaving. You have uh, women that haven't come back full force. They're still caregiving. Um, we're not at the pre-pandemic levels for that, and uh, and there's still a lot going on. And then here here's the most interesting one that that adds to this whole uh, workloads issue. A lot of uh, employees were hopping jobs there for a while. They were taking the quick cash. Well, the problem now, the fallout from that is that they were moving for money and they were moving and jumping and jumping. They never got the skill set that mm -hmm. employers now expect. So there's this great divide between what an employer expects out of an employee at a certain job title and job classification uh, and what they are getting. And that compensation is significantly higher and they're getting less skill set for it. So it's putting a crunch on um, trying to recruit the right people. It's also putting a crunch on training uh, mm -hmm. and mentoring. And then the supervisors are like, oh, um, they're, they're starting to really struggle with everything coming at them. They got to train, they got to mentor, they have to have individual conversations, they got to figure out this whole hybrid world or in person and keeping people motivated. And in certain industries, there's still a talent war. There's there is a oh, yeah. lot going on, and and those are all the topics that we discuss. I know any one of those is a is an hour wow. discussion. That's a long um, list. Mary I'm like, I'm like. Can I add to that list? I know. I was just it's a pretty comprehensive list, but I'm going to try to, I'm going to echo all of that. And I'm going to add a few more things, some of which are highly connected to the things that Jennifer mentioned. So the war for talent, the continued challenge to compensate and figure out the most effective total rewards package for our employees of all ages and all generations. So determining how flexibility plays into that, um, whether or not we should deal with geographic pay differentials, how to handle that when people are moving all over the place. Talent um, has become a little bit easier, but we're certainly starting to hear more organizations doing either small reductions in force or increasingly larger reductions in force they don't always equate to an easing up of recruiting woes because it's not necessarily the same subset of talent that are losing their jobs that are in demand in other organizations. Um, technology, the pace of change in technology is increasingly challenging to employers, not only to afford, but to make sure that they have enough cybersecurity insurance, enough cybersecurity training, um, and then add to that the complications of AI, how to harness it effectively, but not to get into legal hot water. Uh, Jennifer, you touched upon the importance of managers and supervisors, the upskilling needed. I mean, we had a lot of, unfortunately, mediocre managers and supervisors in the workplace before the pandemic and before the rise of remote work, they're not automatically better supervisors now. In many cases, they're worse. Um, and they're not interacting with mentors in the workplace and people that they might be able to learn from because they're you know, at home in their yoga pants or in their basement and they're not learning from their you know, leadership teams or for mentors that could help them 
um, evolve and grow in their skills. Um, the mental health crisis is real. You mentioned burnout. So that kind of goes under that total rewards package. What are employers doing to add to their benefits offerings to ensure that they're not just delivering on a traditional benefits package, but adding additional options to really help employees balance, align their work and family and home and life obligations. So, I mean, again, we could go on for hours delving deeper into each of these areas. It's, it's a, it's a complicated time to, you know, be in business, to be running organizations, to be an employer, to be an HR, mm -hmm. to figure out where to best utilize your resources and how to, you know, recruit and retain the best and brightest is, yeah. you know, never been more challenging. I mean, every year keeps, you know, adding additional uh, challenges to our arena and we've got to keep figuring them out faster and faster because the competitive landscape keeps getting more challenging. That's why I needed Starbucks today. <laughs> Every day. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, you know, you guys are, I'm in a number of CEO forums and places where I'm listening to other leaders talk or just even with our own clients and what's on their minds. And it is, it, it, it does feel like we've been um, in this rapid chess match um, for the last few years where we're constantly moving pieces around and it's, you know, something else pops up and we're having to address that. So it, it, it is complex, but, you know, I think we can only do what we can do, you know, and do a smaller group of things well and, and, and then move on to another smaller group of things. So, you know, really prioritizing what's most important to your organization because we you know, that list was a mile long. So, you know, I, I, I think that would, as I'm thinking about, you know, all of our, our planning that's going to be happening for 2024, I think, you know, you have to really prioritize what's going to have the most impact on your organization. But So, um, Jennifer, you have just a you know, a wealth of resources. I mean, I think some of these things would be so beneficial to um, to organizations. Um, so can you, you know, kind of in the counter of what we were uh, saying in terms of the, the challenges, what are some of the things that you feel like have been um, found in your research and some of the resources that you, you're able to provide? Can you give us a few ideas that sure. people can be activate on fairly quickly? Sure, sure. So we have um, a plethora of resource guides that can touch upon some of those and give some examples of best practices from each of those. Uh, in fact, we just um, released our most recent best practice resource guide uh, and um, what we can learn from each other. Um, the other thing uh, that I wanted to mention is uh, it's ever changing. So, and we just talked about that, right? So whatever you're reading now or studying now, you have to stay on top of it. So we, we every month, we look at our resource guides, we look at the content that we're pushing out and we make sure that it's current and fresh. So for example, um, we focus uh, these guides and education in two areas, uh, C-suite leadership around talent and then uh, people in talent, the, the HR leaders, the CHROs, the director of HRs, VP of HR. So I just wanna focus in that space for this discussion, sure. everything we do. Um, but for example, team bonding and hybrid work. Uh, we I already mentioned defining collaboration. You really need to assign a committee to that and get people from all over the organization, uh, every department, every uh, age group, and really put a committee together and say, how can we outsmart this need to come back to work and actually um, working remote? What, what's the win-win? Um, so some best practices, um, some of the bigger companies are saying, these are the weeks that we are going to be in person. These are the collaboration weeks. Some teams have been saying, these are the collaboration days that you are required to come back. Um, we are seeing a lot of required to come back to work because things are softening out there. 
uh, which is really interesting. Uh, I don't know how I feel about that, though. I think sometimes that's being used as a weapon instead of a reward. Uh, so that needs to be thought out a little bit. And then um, a, a lot of companies have really kind of figured out how to make team bonding happen. Uh, so they're purposefully getting people together, but not to work. That They think that'll come naturally. The collaboration will come naturally. But one of the things that I think is, is really cool is these collaboration days around volunteering into the community. Mm. Yeah. So this is a required day, but we're going to go over to the food bank and we're going to we're going to all work together to help the food bank. Or um, this is a required day, but we're going to turn all our devices off and we're going to go have fun as a team. So those are really easy things to do uh, to get some team bonding, uh, especially in a hybrid work environment. Um we also have a lot of tools and resources around employee engagement. Uh, we talked a lot about the employee tagline and that whole uh, experience. But again, um, some HR teams in Maryland can talk to this too. Our hiring engagement people specifically, engagement ambassadors within departments and then uh, engagement people on the team and their job is to figure it out listen to everyone, create an engagement strategy. We would recommend that. Um, the other thing I wanna remind everybody about is, um, I don't know if you agree with me or not, but we really recommend getting rid of the performance reviews. Uh, some companies can't because of how they're structured, but I would challenge that. Uh, from the data, it is by far the lowest score um, by both the, the supervisor and the employee. Uh, it's almost a D on, on the report card about how do you feel about performance reviews? Are they effective? Are they, get rid of them. They're just stressing people out. <laughs> uh, we recommend individual conversations, um, understanding the human, making sure you're hearing the human. Uh, there is a partner that we have, um, it actually came uh, from a company that was a best and bravest winner. They were not scoring how they wanted to score. So they created mechanisms to become an elite winner and then they became a national elite winner. Um, and they put this whole company together on all the changes that they made and it's called Become Unmistakable. And they put a, a UMAP together where this is what's important to me as a human. This is what's important to me as a family. Um, these are my personal goals. These are my work goals. These are what I need development on. What do you think I need development on? And it becomes a conversation versus you're a six out of seven on this item. Um, so we really would encourage that from an employee engagement perspective or something similar. Um, but again, individualized conversations and engagement has to happen. And we have to train these supervisors to know how to do it and do it well. Um, and then as far as wellness and well-being, a, a lot of things that we think as employers are perks are requirements. So for example, a healthy food in the office being available, um, on-site mindfulness or digital resources for mindfulness, yoga, um, wellness um, events and challenges and whatnot, those are really expected now. Those are not um, uh, a la carte or something that you can just say, I wanna offer it. Uh, it's, it's required. Um, many companies are expanding their, their leave policies for when a child is born. They're including the father in that uh, for these leaves. And then also um, tenure sabbaticals are, are making a, a, a comeback. Uh, you can take a couple weeks off or a month off and you can go do whatever you want and then come back healthy and refreshed. Uh, a lot of positive feedback on those. Um, and no meetings, ooh, no meeting days or weeks ooh, yeah. or your no digital days where you can just crank out work and, and not be disturbed. I know what we do in our organization is, is we close at one o'clock on Friday. And if somebody needs that for mental health time to refresh and go be with their family, they can. Uh, if others need to spend time catching up uh, without the stress of everyone buzzing them every two seconds, 
Um, so, so employers are looking at unique hours in that space as well. Uh, and then there's just one more area that I want to make sure uh, we have a diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative, as well as a resource guide and education and, and uh, tools there. Uh, the feedback that we are hearing is that employers are not walking the talk. Uh, so if the CEO sent out a letter uh, back in 2021 or 2020 on what their endeavors are, are you really living it? And when were, when did you talk about it last? And many young people that are being hired in and trained, they're watching. And um, they want to make sure that whatever's been promised for DEI is actually happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And whatever the corporate responsibility is there uh, related to um, involvement in the community, is it really happening? Or was it just talk? Was it PR? Uh, so uh, one of the things that we notice as the uh, economy may or may not soften in certain industries, um, unfortunately, one of the first budget cuts were the, the people and the activities around D&I. Mm. Are yeah. you really committed to it or are you not? Right. Uh, so employees see that they are staying for those reasons or leaving for those reasons. And if you do not... Um, walk the talk, uh, it, it really hurts you as leadership and, and leadership needs to communicate. If you have a DEI committee, what's happening is in what is the CEO saying about it? Are they supporting those endeavors? Are they funding it? So uh, a lot, there's a lot of best practices, um, a lot of tools that we have. Um, and then um, of course there's organizations like Mary Lynn's that actually helps you implement it. We say what needs to happen, and Mary Lynn says, here's how to do it. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, and so many of the things, Jennifer, that you mentioned, you know, we're working on with our members, we're helping them to implement, we're doing ourselves. We just volunteered at a food bank that's also a member. We're mm -hmm. having a day of celebration on Monday that's going to start with a program from our employee assistance program on mental health. Uh, and then we're going to do a fun group activity and have a fun meal and people are going to get the day off early. Uh, but being more intentional, so many of the things that you mentioned, you kind of wove in the topic of intentionality, like yeah. expecting things to just happen doesn't always auto magically happen. So, right. yeah. you know, letting people know that, you know, the reason we're coming together today is for this purpose. This is what we're hoping to get out of it. Asking people, we recently announced that at our full team meetings, unless you need a laptop, we don't want people to have their laptops there because we don't want people to be distracted. Nice. Um, you know, we want people to be engaging with each other and be truly, you know, present, which is more and more difficult in today's environment. So the intentionality and I think another just global comment based on another long, long list that I hope employers take away is there are so many jumping off points. There is always progress to be made and there is no one size fits all. There are so many different options that might fit your industry, might fit your demographics of your team. To the point of DE&I, we certainly have seen employers struggling with not quite knowing what to do. Um, and we try to work with them and explain there's lots of different options. Again, a lot depends on their team, what's most meaningful, what their budget is, what their challenges are. There isn't just some tried and true list. These are the top five things you need to do in order. There's lots of different ways that you can fully deliver on your DEI commitment. Um, and they don't look the same for every organization. Yeah, I think, you know, it's like ESG. I, I, I really feel like people want to embrace these practices. They want to improve their organizations in these ways. And but there's a little fear around putting it, you know, out there because it's it's not easy. But I, I you know, I think if you at least have a bit of a roadmap as to how you're going to incrementally improve, it's just like anything else. It's like you're not going to start at the top. 
Um, you're going to have to work your way there. It's just about making some, you know, a little bit of incremental improvements along the way. Uh, it's the only way we all get better. So, no, I appreciate you both sharing those those insights with us. And, and you know, Jennifer will include links to a lot of your resources uh, in the follow up email that goes out. But you can find just about everything on on your website. Correct. 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 OK. And then yeah. also, you know, HR Source has a ton of great resources on their site as well. It is, it's hrsource.org, right, Mary Lynn? Sure, it sure is. Okay. All right. So I know we're getting to time and I want to, you know, give everybody an, a, an opportunity to, uh, Parker, if you could throw up how to reach out to Jennifer. If you've got any questions, she is so um, willing to, you know, to give you feedback or so if you want to have a question for her, uh, just reach out on LinkedIn or you can reach out to her via email. Uh, she's uh, just put, you know, business as unusual in the subject line or somewhere in the in the in the chat, and she will know that you had seen her on today's live stream. I also want to just give a plug. She's they they are hosting their summit next week for the best and brightest. Uh, I'm going to be thrilled to be on the panel there, uh, speaking, you know, about our experience uh, as an organization with some other uh, CEOs. So I appreciate you having me next week, and looking forward to traveling to Detroit. Uh, Lastly, I want to, you know, make sure we thank all of our sponsors, Insperity, M3 Learning, and of course, HR Source has been a great partner to us, uh, all great resources, and then tell you a little bit about what to expect for October. It's business as unusual. So we are um, going to feature some of our own red caffeine subject matter experts next next uh, month. Um, we're really excited about this. We haven't done anything very similar to this, but it is that time of year where we're all thinking about what is our growth um, plan or what are we going to put on our priority list uh, next, next year. And so we heard a laundry list of ways we could think about improving our organizations. Um, you know, what other things would we be looking at to elevate marketing or increase sales or update our brand? Or, you know, as Mary Lynn mentioned, what is our technology roadmap going to look like? So we're going to spend an hour really talking you through some of, you know, the things, the tips and tools that we use to help clients with their annual uh, planning. And so people will have an opportunity to walk away with, uh, you know, a, a better view of some of the things they could maybe put into their annual planning process, uh, get some of the eight questions that Red Caffeine uses to start to create that dialogue with leadership teams when we're trying to get input from a, a number of different people, and then who should be involved in the annual planning and, and when, when it should be taking place. So really excited to have our team featured next month, and you guys are going to gonna get a lot of valuable insights from that share, share experience. So that's it. We're going to wrap up. I really want to thank both Jennifer and Mary Lynn for like, oh my gosh, such incredibly valuable information. As always, the time goes very, very quickly, but I, I feel like we we got a lot of value in this last hour. So I hope our uh, our guests attendees, attendees really felt the same, but I learned a, a ton. Thanks, Kathy. It's always great to work with you. And Jennifer, fun to see you on this event today. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. It's been an honor. And I can't wait to check out that October 19th when I want to go to that. <laughs> All right, great. Well, we'll be looking forward to having you. So thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of the week.